Where's the candy? That's what I was talking about. Well, candy's the gone. Well, the real slim, shady, please stand up. It reminds me, 2002, no lie, sitting in your seat right there, Rob. Um, uh, I get this call and one day. It really day. was this chair. It, it was. Years, same chair. <laughs> um, if you recall, the uh, the old ball coach got hired by the Washington, then Redskins. Steve Spurrier. And this call comes in the middle of the afternoon. Would I go on this DC radio station and talk about this hiring? And it, it was really rushed. It was a producer, and you know, hang on, I got to put you on hold. I got to do something. And you, and I'm sitting here going, look, all right, we're a Redskins affiliate. Maybe they're asking, but why would they be calling? So when the guy picks the phone back up, I said, hey, can I ask a question? You ask for Matt. Um, are you? Th- this is Matt Miller. Are you expecting? And he said, you're not Matt Millen. Remember Matt Millen, the former linebacker, who at that time I think was with CBS doing, you know, their uh, color commentary on games and stuff. He mm-hmm. somehow got things mixed up and thought he was ready to talk to Matt Millen, and that was not the real Slim Shady. And he hung up on me in a heartbeat because he was in the middle of a commercial break, expected to have Matt Millen on the horn when they finished. And so I know what I, that's like when the guest is supposed to be ready at yeah. a certain time and you're not there yeah. yet. But I, I was I was 30 seconds away from going on a DC radio station with them fully thinking I was somebody else and could have said just about anything, and they'd have thought Matt Millen. Yeah, that doesn't sound like him. And that would have been interesting. You could have bluffed your way through being Matt Millen for a couple. Did of Did you think it was a good hire at the time? <laughs> I, I don't remember, to be honest. And now that I have hindsight, no, it was not. It was <laughs> uh, 9.36. Uh, it is uh, National School Choice Week, uh, by the way. And our guest in this segment is James Paul, Executive Director of the West Virginia Public Charter School Board. James, good morning. Welcome back to the program. Good morning. Always great to be on with you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it uh, very much, sir, your time today. I'm sure what is a very busy week for you. Uh, what's our uh, total charter school count in the state here as we begin uh, 2024? Right now there are 2,270 students that were officially certified by the state uh, in la- last October, which is the official count day in West Virginia. I suspect the number has grown some since then, but that's the, the official number that will be used for um, reporting purposes this year. What percentage of the total school-going population does that represent at this time, James? Do you know? It's close to uh, a little less than 1% um, of the total uh, public school enrollment in the state. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll have to take a look at the most recent numbers to see exactly where that shakes out. But recall, this is only the the second year of having charter schools in West Virginia um, enrollment doubled from nearly doubled from year one to year two. So I think the sector is on a strong trajectory to get that number up a fair amount. But as I'm sure we'll talk about this morning, the, the point of charter schools, the point of school choice more broadly is to connect parents with schools that meet their kids' needs. And if that's charter schools, I think that's great. If it's private schools, great. Traditional public schools, we just want there to be options so that every child is connected with that right school. And James, do we know uh, the percentage of students in West Virginia that uh, choose to not go to a public school, whether they go to a charter or a private or homeschool or whatever? There likely are statistics on that from the State Department of Ed or maybe the Federal Department of Ed. Um, You know, I I don't have them offhand, but like I said, there's about more than 2,000 students right now in charter schools. There are, I believe, about 5,000 students using the HOPE Scholarship Program, so they're doing a range of private schooling, homeschooling, micro-schooling. So what I can say is that the percentage of families choosing non-traditional options has increased in recent years. West Virginia is definitely on the forefront of expanding educational choice, like other states across the country, too. But West Virginia is really a leader in a lot of ways of promoting school options, opening things up for families to find that right fit. When parents in West Virginia inquire as to charter school opportunities and availabilities, do some of them still think that you charge tuition? Well, everyone is learning about charter schools in West Virginia, although they've been around for 30-plus years nationally. They've, they're new in the Mountain State, and there are a number of things that people are still learning. So that's, that's a question that I hear sometimes. But, um, you know, just to set the record straight again, charter schools 
do not charge tuition. They may not charge tuition. They are free for families to use. Um, they are public schools that are independently managed. So the trade-off with charter schools is more flexibility at the school level to innovate with respect to curriculum, with respect to the types of teachers who can be hired, um, with respect to school day um, length and, and, and length of the school year. And in exchange for that flexibility, there's more accountability, which is that the charter school enters into a contract with an authorizer, which is my board, and that contract determines, you know, the things that the school promises to do, what its outcomes are going to be, what its uh, uh, academic program is going to look like. And if they don't meet the terms of that charter, the charter can be revoked and the school doesn't open anymore. So more autonomy, more flexibility in exchange for that direct accountability with the authorizer. That's the promise of charter schools. James, as you look at other states that have a, a more mature charter existence that has been around several years, what is a realistic number in terms of a percentage that charter schools in West Virginia might reach in terms of percentage of school-going population? You know, there's a number of ways that I could try to estimate that. I'm hesitant to give an exact number. Uh, if you look at if you look in some uh, states that have more densely populated urban centers, charter schools can be a real significant chunk of the of the public education landscape. I believe almost half of the students in Washington D.C. go to charter schools. Philadelphia has, in in Pennsylvania has a very high, maybe thirty percent. Um, I'm not sure off the top of my head, but the numbers can get quite high. Now, in states that are more rural or don't have um, the, the population density, the overall charter percentage tends to be lower. So I think a reasonable target for the short to medium term future would be um, up near 10 percent in West Virginia. But we'll have to see. Again, I'm not uh, entirely focused on what the share is of the charter sector in particular. Uh, what I want to make sure is that the whole school choice environment is working, traditional county schools, charter schools, Hope Scholarship, so that families can be connected with schools that meet their needs. And uh, Matt and Matt are going to have questions for you in a second, but my next question for you before I turn it over to them for some questions is, uh, can you identify the charter school locations in the state mm -hmm. And which ones are physical locations versus which ones are virtual? Yeah, so right now there are five charter schools that are authorized and open. Two of those are virtual schools, West Virginia Virtual Academy, Virtual Prep Academy. So those serve students in all 55 counties, um, and, and they're, they're based at home for, for where the student lives. The other three schools, there's one in Jefferson County, Eastern Panhandle Prep, there is a charter school in um, Mon County, West Virginia Academy, that's in Morgantown. And then there is a, um, our newest charter school is uh, in the Charleston area. It, it operates actually as an administrative unit of Bridge Valley Community and Technical College. Um, and that's just for 11th and 12th graders who are interested um, in, in nursing. So th that's three physical locations kind of spread out across the state two virtuals, and then there are three more schools that are authorized to open in, in the fall of 24 that are all brick and mortar. And, uh, you know, I'm having discussions every day with operators inside West Virginia um, and out of state who are looking to come here and set up more in-person learning options. I, I, the last thing I'll say is that According to state law, there can only be two virtual charter schools at one time. So all of the new charter schools that come in will be um, more traditional in-person learning opportunities for families. Matt Miller. James, when you mentioned earlier the, the high percentage of those in a charter school in the bigger cities, the D.C.'s, the Philadelphia's, what is the biggest challenge in West Virginia in trying to locate where you may put the brick-and-mortar charter schools? Well, typic, you know, I would say that typically the model for the historical model for opening a new charter school has been to find an area with a lot of nearby population and find the funding to create a large physical building in an area. 
uh, where there is demand for additional choice. And I think one thing that we're working through in West Virginia is that there's just there aren't a lot of big cities that have a lot of population. So some of the charter school operators are having to be um, creative or strategic about where they decide to open up. Obviously, there are still relatively high population areas, and, and that's where many of the early charter school locations have been established. But I, I'm talking with operators right now who are in the early stages of thinking about applying, who are looking at innovative ways to serve students even in our less populous areas in, in southern West Virginia. I think there are some innovative ways that charter schools can establish that will look a little different. They won't be one large building that serves 2,000 students in one place, but they could be, for, for example, a school that operates under one charter but has multiple smaller locations uh, across a larger region. Um, this is just one idea that, I, that I've kicked around with some folks that look at West Virginia, see the need, see the interest that families are having for more options, and, and want to make those opportunities available in the Mountain State. You were reading my mind on my notes. I just wrote campus with three lines out from it and then one county, one county, one county beside each of those lines. So that is a possibility where you could have one charter school with like a main campus in a southern county in West Virginia with not a large population. But out of that same school, basically, there's a campus in the counties on each side of that main county campus. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, in principle, that's something that I support and I, I would like to see happen. I think that would be likely how we get a, a large, sustainable school in some of the more rural areas. Of course, part of the job of the authorizer is to work through the specifics of what that will look like with the charter school applicant, make sure that everything that both sides want to do is compliant with the charter school law. So we would you know, dot all our I's and cross all our T's on the details of that when we got close. But that is a general model that I think could work and and would be uh, potentially really effective in some areas that are not the high population centers of the state. When you mentioned the earlier the uh, 2,270 or so students, are the majority of majority of those part of me through the virtual schools or or what are the numbers like in the actual uh, three brick and mortar facilities in Jefferson Mon and Kanawha County the majority is in the virtual sectors for now and from year one to year two that has been where the biggest growth has occurred has been in the virtual schools and I think you know from my perspective that's very exciting and that says something about what parents are what at least some parents are looking for when it comes to their K-12 education. And I'm thrilled that the virtual schools are able to meet that need. As far as getting increased enrollment and increased um, physical locations, part of the, of the way to get there is through legislative change. And this is something that I've spoken about before, before several state committees, which is um, some, some opportunities for the legislature to improve funding for charter school facilities um, or to provide fundings for charter schools in the pre-opening and startup period to help them with their costs in, the, in that first summer and first school year. Because it, it's an, it really is an entrepreneurial venture to go from zero to 60, to go from no school to now we have a building, we have staff, we have students, we have all these upfront costs and the state of West Virginia currently doesn't provide much help at all in that startup period. So uh, I know there are conversations being had about some legislative fixes to help charter schools um, kind of get, get off the ground successfully. And I, I'm confident that with, with those changes and with continued, uh, with everybody learning the, how things work here, that there will be more brick and mortar charter schools and, and more growth um, in those sectors. Matt Harvey. Mr. Paul, good morning. Uh, <clears throat> I'm also the Jefferson County prosecuting attorney, and and so when I'm hearing about online charter schools, I think about the truancy issue in West Virginia. And is is do you see that, or is that being used as, as a potential one solution to some of the truancy problems, which oftentimes could be a, a parent, or sometimes could be a parent is, is having trouble 
because of their work schedule or, or whatever issues they may have getting the child to school and that could be remedied by just logging on uh, well i'm i'm not sure if i totally understand your question so let me try to answer and then you maybe you can clarify it but i I'll, generally i will say the reasons that families opt in to virtual schools um, th there are many reasons. There are many different t types of students. Some, you know, choose virtual schooling because of a difficult situation at home or a difficult situation in a previous public school um, or because of, uh, you know, a particular health challenge or, or a, unique, a unique travel schedule for the student or the family. So th there are a lot of reasons why a family might opt into a virtual school. Some students opt into virtual schools because they are move. They, they want to move more quickly, and they want a more personalized experience. So, um, you know, I can't speak to any particular example other than just to say, uh, yes, virtual schools can be an option for uh, families with kind of non-traditional backgrounds and non-traditional experiences. Um, the the other side of that coin is that there are very strict requirements on the virtual schools to make sure that. If they, you know, that if they have students on their roles, they need to be engaging those students, making sure that they're um, participating in class, partic participating uh, in their assignments, submitting their work. And if they're not, uh, if they're not present, if they're not connecting with their teachers, if they're not showing up virtually, then both virtual schools have policies in place to get in touch with those families, figure out what's going on, um, you know, and then take the appropriate steps, if necessary, to work with the county boards of education to try to find students who aren't there. But to, to this point, to my knowledge, this has, you know, this has not been a problem yet, but everyone wants to make sure that no students fall through the cracks. If someone goes to a, if a student goes to a charter school, are they allowed to play sports? Or will charter schools be able to have a sports team in the future? The answer is yes to both of those. So the, the way the law is written, it's very clear in my view. Charter schools uh, are free to offer clubs and sports and they, you know, they can have, they can offer those opportunities to their students. Um, however, you know, at a smaller charter school or at really at any school, it may not be feasible um, to offer certain types of sports like football. You're probably not going to be able to have a full football team if your ninth through 12th enrollment is only 50 kids or something like that. So the way the law works is if a charter school does not offer a sport or an extracurricular activity, then the student is able to play that sport at their resident county um, school system. So if you, if you live in uh, Berkeley County and, your charter and you go to a charter school there, and they don't offer a sport, you're able to play at your residentially assigned school. Um, and, and so basically the way this should work you can is that all, all opportunities are available to, to do sports and extracurriculars for a charter student. But you could also transfer. <laughs> so if you lived in Martinsburg, you could transfer to, you know, Musselman or... Oh, but that wasn't your question, though. No. I, I, I'm, just, I'm just thinking through this, like with this new transfer rule. Right. Like you could, you, you could, could go to, go where you, you could go online and then uh, you could live in Jefferson County, go online school and then go play at Martinsburg. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, I won't speak specifically. I know the transfer rule has been a big subject of interest uh, for a while here and that that is relevant to this discussion. But I think first I'll just, just to be clear. Um, yeah, that would be a little different. I'm just, I'm just speaking directly to, you know, if a student that is enrolled in a charter school, what are their opportunities? They can either do everything that their school offers, and if their school doesn't offer it, uh, they can play or participate in their county uh, at their residentially assigned school. Now, of course, you know, that part of school choice is that families can, um, can choose other schools. So uh, there, there are mechanisms to uh, move from one public school to another through traditional open enrollment. I'm not as familiar on, on the details of that. Um, but the bottom line is that the legislature clearly wants charter school students to have full access to extracurriculars and sports. The great thing about school choice is it gives the parents and the student a chance to find the right fit sure. for that mm -hmm. student instead of one size fits all. 
And I know there's a lot of controversy about virtual learning and the effects of it on COVID, but my next door neighbor's son did not do well in the classroom, actually excelled during virtual learning during COVID. And then that carried over when they went back to the classroom, that actually carried over now into the classroom again. So in this particular case for that kid, virtual learning worked great and yeah. also helped the kid succeed in the classroom later. Yeah, go ahead, uh, James. I just wanted to add to that point on virtual learning. There is a big difference between the virtual learning that families received in a, you know, really a state of emergency, a state of panic in the, um, you know, in the spring of 2020 and throughout mm-hmm. 2020 versus virtual learning that's provided by operators who have done this type of educational model for two decades. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's not fair for someone to say, oh, boy, virtual learning didn't work well during COVID, so why would we have it now, which is something that I hear, but I reject that completely because it was, a, I mean, everyone remembers what it was like, especially in the early stages of that pandemic, and you simply can't say that because virtual learning didn't work well in an emergency situation run by teachers and school systems who didn't have experience or much experience doing the virtual model, that then all virtual schooling uh, is no good. I think clearly there is a way to do this model in a way that works for families. And the best evidence for that is the growth that we're seeing in our virtual schools in West Virginia. And look, they may not be right for everyone. They may only be right for students for for a short period of time. Um, You know, it may be something that a student needs to do for a year or two. And and that's another thing that that the, the virtual schools can navigate and deal with. But I think it's really important to have this option um, for exactly the reason you said, to make sure that that schools are connected, excuse me, that families are connected to the right fit for their kids because every child is different. Yeah, and that's ultimately the point here. Uh, And you might say, well, then send your kid to private school, but maybe you can't afford private school, right? So that's that's not a realistic option for you. So maybe a charter school works out for you. Is, is the specialization like they're doing? About 30 seconds. Here. The specialization, is that, do you, do you see that being uh, a bigger trend in charter schools in West Virginia? Need a quick answer from you, James. Absolutely, yes. Uh, you know, I, I think in particular, the look, at, look at what's happening at Wynn Academy in Charleston with this focus on nursing. Look at what's happening in Morgantown with West Virginia Academy with their um, they're, they're getting um, online with the International Baccalaureate pro- Program. James, on and that note, i got to cut you off because I literally <laughs> so just, just run out of time. Thanks so much. Appreciate your time, sir. Thanks, guys. Take care.